It is December the 30th, 2023 still? Yeah, and this is the future of photography. <laughs> oh my god. The future of photography. Hello, welcome back everyone. And Happy New Year! It's uh, We're recording this on the 30th, but it's going to be released on... Well, sometime in the first week of January, so... I'm a little bright, so please bear with <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah, Jeremiah, you're entitled to be bright in the new year. It's, good, Just, it's a good thing. Yes, it is. Um, so, Jeremiah here, Adrian here, the three of Hi. us. Yes, Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, Happy yeah. New Year. And let's see how we how we okay we were we're debating how do we want to kick off the new year and we thought what, what about an AMA an ask me anything and ask each other questions and uh, we have probably too many questions looking at the document it's uh, rather rather packed so anyway um. I think we'll just take turns and see how far we get. And uh, if we have any left, then we might carry them over to the next episode. Um, who wants to go first? Go ahead. I Ooh. will. I'll, I'll jump in. I'll jump okay, in Jeremiah. What but, is yeah. your, your, what's your first question? My first question is, is how does where you live, your culture, your sense of place, where you spend most of your time, influence uh, your work and practice as a photographer? Oh, that's a deep question. That is a and deep one question. And one I'm completely not prepared for. You have 60 seconds. <laughs> so, well, I'll, I'll try. Okay, so uh, let me see what I can do about that then. So uh, I don't take a lot of landscape photographs because I don't live in a place that is famous for its amazing landscapes. So I suppose it might influence that way. Although I do what I call urban landscape photography uh, because I happen to live near a big city. Um, so there's that. Uh, I think um, I'm not also just a not... big city, but a famous city with lots of uh, famous landmarks and things. That's true. Yes. So, so I, I live uh, an hour on the train outside of London. Uh, so that gives me uh, a, a wealth of opportunity to go and shoot around the city as I, as I head up to London. And trains. Uh, and trains. <laughs> yeah. When they work. Yes. There are sometimes trains. Um uh so uh yeah so i guess that 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 would be the the very swift answer to that question is that it's based upon you know uh i forget who it, which which famous photographer it was that said if you want to take more interesting photographs point your camera at more interesting things <laughs> um uh you know so so that for me is the bit where it gets starts to get interesting is uh, i live in a a, a, a quiet town where you know there's not a lot going on i do take photos around our town sometimes but not very often um so i think that probably influences what i do with photography yeah i was get, trying to get at what the cultural zeitgeist of the uk britain england um has over one's developed aesthetic in, in other words a deeper not not just the okay. surface of where you are, but the overall feel of how you were raised and and the milieu in which you live culturally. How does that translate, if at all? Ooh. <laughs> so, so, is, so let me go back Britishness? to what is Britishness? That's the question. Uh, so the, the, yeah. the, there's no such thing as Britishness. Um, yeah, the, 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 there's a lot of talk about you know British values and stuff like that, but that comes from people who are pretty hardline conservatives a lot of the time. So I try to avoid talking about that sort of thing. I'm, I'm glad we live in a multicultural society. Uh, but the I suppose that there is one thing that I would say as an off the cuff response, Jeremiah, which go, in going back to my zine, which I published last year, um, actually, as this goes out the year before last now, um, which I've been sharing some copies with with my family, my extended family over Christmas, actually, and they've enjoyed seeing that. Um, I would say that it's more of the time and the things I was doing, you know, that influence my my aesthetic so if i think about the the graphical nature of the images in that zine i think uh, i'm a product of my time it takes me back as we've talked about before to time when zines were produced on xerox machines and you know that that gives me an aesthetic from a, a point in time which is probably i don't know let's let's just call it the the 90s um and uh to to, to go with that i think uh, so it's not the crown <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, no, it's not. No, Chris, 
it's not Babylon Berlin. <laughs> well, it's, no, no, it's not. It's uh, for, for me. And again, I'm I'm not after trying to shoot Germanness because uh, same 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 as same as Adrian, the values and things that are held up are usually from a more conservative point of view. So um, I do not fully identify with that. <laughs> so. Um, that's one of the reasons I like to go other places and try to explore them and find out more about them. But what I what I need, of course, um, or what I what I think is important is um, the place I live, the place around me, which isn't the most exciting place here in northern Germany. Um, everything's flat; <laughs> landscapes are are very difficult. Um, is more of a it's a it's a it's a training ground of sorts. You know, there's if you if you manage to make the mundane um look exciting interesting. and interesting then uh you will make everything look interesting that's a, it's a it's a thing where i develop skills but do we it's, work against our culture sometimes oh sure uh, and yes. sometimes we can't help but be driven by it yeah, of course. I mean, I'm I I grew up here. I grew up and my a lot of my sensibilities have been shaped I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, um, from the photography back then, from cultural influences back then. So a lot of that is in me in some. So way. I'm, and, and, and <clears throat> I assume by your accent, Adrian, that you grew up in England. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and, I live in the town. I, I've lived in since I was 11 years old. So um, I'm, I'm the apple that didn't fall from the tree. I live five miles from my parents. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I, I mean, it, it happens that it's a nice place. Very fortunate to have grown up here. And, and you know, I just never really left. <laughs> I've never, I, 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 I tried while I was a student living in a city um, and I found that cities weren't really for me. So after that, I was like, well, I'll stay where I am then because it's easy enough to travel to get work and it's a nice place to live. So I've always thought my my, my home is, is the place I come to, to to be relaxed and be away from things as opposed to right in the thick of it. That's I always thought if I was going to live in a city, I'd want to live right. Yeah, I'd want to live, mm. open my door into the liveliest places, the yeah, Soho in London or, or or equivalents in other cities, you know, something like that. <clears throat> yeah, it's, prob I, it's probably also a difference between Europeans and Americans in that Well, respect. true. And also, you know, I am dual citizen. I am far from the tree that I fell from yeah. um, in many, many ways. You know, so, you know, I've lived in many, many places, um, like really lived, not just visited, um, but have made California my home for, uh, you know, probably 35 years or more. And and um, so I have a very different, uh, a, you know, viewpoint, you know, as an immigrant, um, though I feel very much at home here, but, it, but I know that California has really influenced me. Uh, and how I see the world and how I see light um, and landscape because it's very dynamic here. It's the opposite. It's extremely forceful on every level. So yeah. I think where we live and our culture does influence our, you know, uh, the what we see and how we see it. So just food for thought. All right, all you listeners. <laughs> I'll I'll jump it. I'll jump in with a with a with a very like run of the mill one, but I think. Um, Forcing myself even to think about this uh, was a nice exercise. Uh, if you could go back and give your beginner photographer self one piece of advice, what would that be? Who's going to grab that first? Well, all the three of us, I guess. Well, maybe so, maybe I, I'll, I'll go. For, I, I think I'll, yeah. I'll go first then on this one. Um, so I mean, it's it's interesting. So uh, I mean, I, I've been. I picked up photography as an adult rather than, you know, earlier in life. So, you know, some uh, 15 or so years ago, I guess, is when I got properly interested in photography. If I could go back to, to that person, that time, uh, and, and uh, you know, I I probably would be full of joy and expectation for that person, right? Because I've had a fantastic time learning about photography uh, over the last 15 years and practicing photography over the last 15 years. Uh, I, I think the, uh, I, I do by my nature tend to think about things quite a lot. 
um, uh, and maybe overanalyze things. So I would probably say to myself, you know, it's okay just to, to, to point the camera and go, just to experiment and explore and don't worry about anything. Just go and enjoy it and, and uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's not that you can easily break you. things, you know, so... Yeah, yeah ex too. exactly that. Exactly yeah. that. Um, and yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, I think that's something that I, I don't feel like I've I've done myself a disservice over the last fifteen years in that regard. But I I think it would be you know just a, a an affirmation kind of thing, an affirmation piece of advice. Go back to and say, go for it. Yeah, really go for it. It's going to be loads of fun. You're going to learn a huge amount, and you're going to see the world differently. So yeah. enjoy. Well, I had, you know, I had a you know a similar advice that. Um, was given to me when I was just developing, still in my teens, um, as an artist. Um, I happened to be lucky enough uh, to spend four hours one to one with Jacques Henri Lartigue and his mm -hmm. agent uh, ways, and and he was visiting the university I was at. I spoke French, so I, I was in charge of. <laughs> making sure he got to where he was and he gave a little talk and showed work, etc. And afterwards I got to spend many, many hours with him one-on-one. -on -one. And his advice was uh, simply what yours was. Just keep shooting. Don't think about it. Keep making work. You'll find within the work patterns evolve and you follow these paths. Some will lead nowhere, some yeah. will lead everywhere, but it's that process the exploration of it that is so fun remember he, he some of his most memorable photos were taken when he was a child right just a boy um we consider him one of the fathers of photography um yeah. and i was uh, you know in awe uh, in many ways um but also captivated by his warmth and, and generosity at spending time with me and i i knew that i was in a moment of you know, just spanning a century, effectively, of of information that would be valuable. And his was very similar to the advice that you would have given yourself, Adrian. Keep shooting. Don't think about it. You know, let let the work educate you rather than you try and dominate it. When I got into photography, uh, I don't think I would have really taken any advice from anyone anyway. <laughs> so, but yes, along the same vein, have fun with it because um, I've seen people drop out of these kind of things, of these creative endeavors, because I don't know, they they didn't see themselves become better fast enough you know and then the frustration kicks in because you see all the great photos out there you you do have the taste but you do not have the skill early on so you you see other photography you can't really match it you just enjoy keep doing it and um yeah so that was my simple one uh adrian okay. your turn okay all right well so i'm gonna i've got i'm gonna uh, have separate questions for you guys actually um but but with a theme about the the future of of your work so i'm gonna ask jeremiah first so jeremiah uh, his question what is the future of tv right so well, we've got multiple chat with a multitude of channels that we can watch to you know quick uh, content on um we are perhaps some pundits say we're past the peak investment now in the streaming side of the businesses and yeah so there's a business element to this and of course we've got real issues on who gets to share the value and how much value they get to share as as we've seen with with strikes over the last year so what was your view on what what's the future of tv um this is a very, very difficult question to answer. And if anyone gets this right, <laughs> they'd be flying yeah. private for the rest of their lives and their children's lives. Unfortunately, nobody really knows. Uh, if I was to kind of where we are at this very moment, uh, we're in a chaotic interregnum at this point in the industry. Um, we are about to enter another cycle of consolidation. And I, I refer to, say, the film business, which had grown quite stale in terms of big studios. Those, those studios kind of created the opportunity for independent studios like October Films and whatnot. And they produced a lot of very uh, uh, amazing independent movies that then got distribution. 
their success led to a consolidation where the studios swallowed those smaller distributors and less uh, interesting movies um, started to propagate in, in terms of the big studios. There are always exceptions that prove the rule independently, and this is no slouch on the great movies that are being made, but more difficult to make them. TV is going through the same cycle um, with uh, the kind of expansion of streaming, the opportunity to kind of find niche audiences, very specific audiences, and do amazing, amazing work internationally and have that recognized and seen um, was just uh, a, a, basically a godsend for creators. Uh, but now we find that the, you know, I guess the legacy studios and financiers are looking at the success of Netflix and trying to replicate it within their old business model. And what's happened is a consolidation of studios. There used to be so many studios to sell your work. Um, there were so many distributors to distribute your work and you could get them financed by a bank. That's no longer the case. You need these big, big conglomerates to finance your pictures and they are always looking for four quadrant, uh, which, you know, just to appeal to everybody. Um, so this uh, consolidation, which is going to be, I think, uh, ugly um, and not particularly advantageous for the niche audiences because of the debt that these studios and financiers are going to find themselves in to finance the consolidation that has tended to make more mundane programming that reaches more people. Now, there is the alternative to that, which are things like YouTube. There's nothing to prevent independent financiers to create amazing work using today's technology with great writing, stories, etc., um, and distributing that through um, models that had never existed before. And yet we have not seen the Citizen Kane of kind of online independent um, work come through those kind of alternatives. I suspect that we may, but it all comes down to stories. And I think that if you're a you know, in your 20s and looking to get into the media business, you probably are looking towards gaming rather than film and certainly TV. So I don't know how it's going to be, of course. Uh, I continue to, you know, be hopeful that there'll always be opportunities to do uh, more um, specific niche programming for interesting uh, but not super broad tastes that we can find ourselves um, looking at, at 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 kind of images. I say in terms of still image, images, um, painting, and that goes for galleries and what they're showing. TV is no no different, but uh, there is that battle between the specific small audience and the big large ones that are very much. Um, controlled by one's debt. So interesting. Lots, of, lot, lots to unpack in there. I'm going to have to listen back answer. to that response. That's, yeah, that's, that's a very good answer, answer, but it's also got loads of stuff in it. I have to listen back to it. Yeah, at the moment, I'm just thinking, okay, so so gaming's going to take the place of TV. Interesting. So that, that's it. So uh, that's just one of the many, many things you said, right, Chris? So my 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 similarly themed question for you is is actually about the uh, the, the travel and touring nature uh, of your work because I know you have multiple lines of business but i I sort of pick this one because i think it might be the the one that many of our listeners know you for um so what's the future of travel photography and photo tours so we've got environmental impacts to balance now we've got bad tourism versus good tourism yeah what's your what's your thoughts on on the future of travel photography well, it depends if uh, the, the the answer might depend if you ask someone who has a conscience and someone who doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so very, very simple. Um, travel photography has its implications, um, and I've done it for years. But uh, times have changed um, with a lot of time to think about things, including uh, including the the thing that has been with us for the last few years. Um, of course, um, then the whole climate uh, side of things is is a uh, is one that is near and dear to my heart. So, um, 
and that and that's why I've changed and and I'm exploring new avenues. I do not have all the answers, but uh, last year when I did this Eastern European tour in an EV, is it's a, it's a different kind of travel, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. So um, that's my short term answer right now. Um, moving in a different direction, and it's not my 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 entire line of business. It's not. Um, the main thing I do, it's it's one of the many things I do. I've just started writing a new book. So um, diversification is is kind of key for a, for a small producer like myself. So that's, um, that's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, like I say, I chose the travel photography bit yeah. because, of course, a lot of our listeners will know that that, that aspect of your work. But, you know, uh, it is possibly it's, a little bit a, simplistic to ask it just for if from that point of view. Well, it's 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 always, and I think Jeremiah, you will you will also have this phenomenon. As soon as you are at least a little bit in the public eye, you will be known for one thing, right? Mm -hmm. And and you have many facets, but of course, for different bubbles out there, you will be known for one specific thing that might be different things. But so it's it's always juggling these different personalities. Um, and yes, it's hard to consolidate all the bubbles into one. It's not possible. Soda. <laughs> it's not. It's not possible. It's totally not possible. So some people will. For for some people, I will probably disappear because I do not do the big photo tours to Ethiopia and so on. Um, for other people, I will be more visible because I'm doing things that aligns more with them. So over time, things will change. Again, I don't have all the answers. I never will have all the answers. But this is about experimenting, about trying things out and see where where things go and and do things that I enjoy doing, which is for me the most important thing. So if 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 I don't like what I'm doing, then yeah, it'll it, it'll not be good. Yeah, good. Well, thank you both. That's yeah, good good insight. Thank you both. All right. Um Jeremiah, next one from you. Um I think I'd like to know what um two photographers, like sort of a, a combo of two photographers that were the greatest influences on your work as you started your photography. Um, uh, you know, by example, I'll, I'll just for myself, uh, you know, Edward West and, and Irving Penn uh, really defined um, a certain aesthetic as I was coming up. I was mainly a, into painting, but when I discovered Weston and Irving Penn, they're classicist. And then on the flip side, you know, Martin Parr and Stephen Shore, their, their irony and their sense of Everything is interesting. So th both of these pairs are completely different than each other, but I'd say they influenced my aesthetic profoundly. So I, I ask both of you this question. I'll I'll pick this one up first. Um, and, and we had an episode earlier, like last year or maybe two years ago, where we talked about uh, some influences. So uh, I'll I'll I'll. I'll double what I said back then. And the first, rock and roll. <laughs> first one is Jim Rakete, which is a German photographer who um, who pretty much shot a lot of the covers of the musicians of the LPs that I grew up with, the music that roll. I grew up with. So it's not just rock and roll. Well, yeah, no, yes and no. Mm. I mean, he, he and he also managed some of those bands, including Nena, by the way. Um, mm. So... Um, that's that's some of the music I grew up with, and uh, and and his photography gave me permission to experiment, to try weird things, to 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 not follow the rule book because his uh, compositions were usually weird, strange, high contrast, um, placing people where you're not supposed to place people in a shot, and so on. So um, he threw the rule book out for me, and that was a good thing. And the other one is uh, is Cartier Bresson. He, I, I, I'm just his sensibilities of like order in a photo, of placement, of space, of um, motion, and how he managed that um, with apparent ease um, is just, yeah, it it suits me well to have shots that are, or or I've I've strived ever since since I've found out about his photography to. Um, to purposefully place things in 
to to give the viewer a feeling that this photo has been taken with purpose. Mm. So that's my answer. Good answers. Uh, okay, so I've got half an answer to this one. Thank you, Chris, for buying me some time. Uh, <laughs> the the half an answer I have would be William Eggleston. Oh, uh, mm. and oh, by uh, the way, by the way, you recommended his book, um, oh, yes, uh, the I guide. I uh, bought that for Christmas based on your recommendation, and now it's part of our collection here as well. I did. I did too. <laughs> did, you, did you did you both enjoy it yes oh oh i i knew a lot of his photos but yeah. this yeah. the combination of photos in that book um is yeah yeah so so he would be he would be somebody i would say um influenced me in the sense that i i've all since i first became aware of his work i've been thoroughly intrigued by how it is that you can make everyday things seem interesting how you can uh, take pictures that look like snapshots but are just that have a lot of depth yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. that that too and also his treatment of color Mm -hmm. um, so, I um, he was, you know, uh, I know we, we, many of us will know that, that he was one of the first, uh, artists working in color to beat, to be recognized, uh, you know, in, in the photographic art world, but actually he, uh, uh, he also did a lot of innovative work in how to print in very vibrant colors. Mm. And so, uh, and, and that's, he, he yeah. was very active Cibacrom printer. Uh, and so, and so that, that sort of thing, you know, how, how to, to render those colors and how to see the color and, and to take photos of color rather than of things, right. And, and things like that. So he influenced me in that way beyond that, I think, uh, and I, if I went to back to my archives and stuff like that, I'm sure I'd be able to find an, a second name. Um, but I would say beyond that, that it's the, the ideas from multiple photographers. So it's the humor of Elliot Erwitt. It's the, you know, the, the, the brash in your faceness of some of the 1980s street photographers. Again, there's a New York influence here, isn't there? Um, yeah. So lighter. Yeah. Uh, and thing, uh, things like that. So, so I guess maybe that, that that's all, th yeah, that, that's a lot of stuff all centered around New York and all based around, you know, experiencing the life and, and, and the people in a city. So I'd probably say, yeah, they're definitely that. Um, and then uh, I think we mentioned Martin Parr already, you know, uh, in his work, um, the, the, the rawness of it. Uh, and yes, so I take ideas, I think, from various different areas, various different artists and, and groups. Uh, and try and experiment with them, but the but the one that really sticks out that just I can't get out of my head and have never been able to is Eggleston. Would you agree that that uh, that Eggleston gave birth to Martin Parr? With that, without I Eggleston, see different there, things. They, they reside in the I, same bucket for me in in some way. But uh, when I think of Martin Parr, I think of his people photographs right i think of him walking around you know housing estates or or around you know along the beach you know and taking photographs of the people and what they and how they behave. i i i i understand intellectually your question jeremiah but it's not the way not the it's not the the segment of martin parr's work that really speaks to me it's it's the expressions on people's faces and uh, mm. you know that that really Fair get enough. me from martin yeah. parr so so yeah. so I, I i i my answer would have to be no but 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 that's the reason for it not because i don't see the link if you see what i mean it's it's funny because my recollection like if i think of eggleston i think of you know close ups of a tablecloth check uh, a painted ceiling I, mm -hmm. I i don't think immediately of the people I think of objects, but, um, and similarly with par, maybe that's because of, I'm interested in, in the ultra mundane that lies before us, but I, I take your point and yes, the people, the faces, their body types, all of that is, is very much part of that, um, approach or what he's looking for. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um, All right. Does that bring it back to? Oh no, it's Jeremiah to go next, then, isn't it? Oh no, that was Jeremiah. No, no, question. it's me. It's me. Me. Um, having having asked you the question, what would what advice would you give? Now I'm I'm turning it towards um, some actual feedback. What is the most valuable piece of feedback that you've ever received about your photography? 
I, I'm going to jump in with this because I have one that always I always remember and makes me smile. And it's one I think I've mentioned relatively recently on the podcast as well. Uh, I have an aunt who's a keen photographer uh, and she, uh, a long time ago, very much at the beginning, it's probably within the first year of me picking up a camera and getting interested in photography. Uh, I showed her a photograph I'd taken and uh, she said to me, that's a good record of the event, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! That really hurts. That does that. And it's a it. She she was a member of a a classic sort of local camera club where you know certain um yeah we uh, and you know uh, I know it's I know it's a thing that travels a little bit further than the UK, but but there's a very British way of being part of a camera club and criticizing people's work, um and uh, that that was definitely a criticism. So so I'm, I'm sorry. I, I hope she doesn't listen to this. Uh, sorry, Auntie Lynn. Um, the uh, yeah, but uh, that's that's something that has uh, has stuck with me. Like, okay, I need to be looking. I need to be making photographs that actually have. I know a subject or a point or a story or a, a message or or something. Um, so it's a harsh one, but that that's the thing that jumps to my mind immediately. Um, <laughs> I, I I would say that um, the most valuable piece of feedback that I've ever had is not something that it has been expressed in words, but in a gallery setting, when somebody buys one of your works, the that is that is feedback. Put, yeah, put your money where your mouth is. The, I'm always so heartened um, by that commitment um, to own a piece of me, um, and it establishes a significant relationship between the buyer and the creator that transcends money it's not about the money it's it's really about they they want to be or live with the image as i expressed it and that is the kind of the engine or the fuel that kind of uh is a very valuable not in economic terms, but in kind of egocentric terms, like, wow, that significance um, connects me with the world. And that's what I want my work to do is just kind of put, pull that, you know, those threads into the universe and see where they land. So I would say that, I mean, it sounds like kind of a crass response. Yeah, when people buy my work, it's good, but... <laughs> I feel good, <clears throat> but, yeah, but I think it's a little deeper than I, I get. I get it. I get it. Um, uh, and I, I was looking for that answer on my side, and it's, it's not really one single thing that does it. Because I don't know. I've. I, I mean, the the moment you start daring to put your work out there in front of people, and the internet has made that easy. So showing work to others. Um, that's the moment you start getting feedback, and the the and most of the feedback is nice shot or no feedback at all, uh, or even easier, you click a thumbs up button, and that is of course not real feedback. But uh, then if someone someone says something, I mean, I can remember someone typing under a photo, um, and that's really early on saying needs more people. Because <laughs> because I did what a lot of photographers do when they start off. They shoot things that don't get annoyed when you shoot them. Also, there's a danger. There's a danger of feedback, AK reviews, you know, of, of the You work. should do your thing, right? And uh, yeah. yeah, I understand. Yeah. And it, it it's a very slippery slope because, you know, as a filmmaker, I tend not to read reviews uh, because if I read good reviews, um, then I have to read bad ones too. And I, I don't want the reviews themselves, which are an opinion, um, unless the, it, unless it's a critical analysis of your work, which is a lot more deep. You can learn from that about yeah. what you're actually doing. Um, but 
but I, I, I do think, you know, there's a sidebar story for actors who are performing in a play. Uh, they never, ever read reviews, or most of them don't, because uh, if if uh, a reviewer says, oh, I love the way they kind of came on stage and just did a flurry with their body and settled, that consciousness in the next performance will be self-conscious yes. and it'll never be the same, never be spontaneous or real. And there's the there's always a danger that you'll start to repeat yourself for the benefit of in the endorphin rush for the positive review and go off track and further from what is really developmental work and expansion. You'll just start to repeat. That's a danger. So, but I, I say that for positive feedback. I mean, negative feedback, you go like, well, they just don't get it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but with, I think the danger really is, is in positive feedback in the wrong way, um, can be detrimental. All right. Uh, why don't we take a break from the questions here? We have a few more, but um, we also have a few more picks. So sure. how about diving right into those? Um, Adrian, what is Wilder? Oh, uh, well, Wilder is uh, a, a great little company, husband and wife team here in the UK who make notebooks. So uh, I've, you know, I, I've put uh a bunch of my effort and in, in learning and new new experiences this year into uh writing um writing yeah sort of journaling trying to sort stuff out trying to learn new things you know just basic note taking all sorts of stuff like that uh and uh along the way uh comes interesting new toys to collect like fountain pens and different inks and notebooks and stuff like that because you know what hobby is complete without you know a good stuff a good load of stuff that you can you can can collect uh and wild is simply uh a, a little notebook company um that uh uh, I, I've bought some of their products and used them, and and they're great. They do some that are the size of field notes, you know, or moleskin cahiers for those that that know those sort of notebooks. They do others in different size, like A5 size or something slightly larger. So you can have a pocket size, you can have a desk size. Um, it's they're 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 you know they they're just a good product, right? They're they're absolutely not unique, uh, but they're one I've I, I've used, and they seem like really nice people. I put in an order um uh, on their website, uh, and about three or four days later, I got a, a text message from the owner of the company saying, "Really sorry, there's a delay on your order." And I I only ordered it a couple of days ago, uh, and they sent me some extra free stuff in my order just because they felt sorry that they that's yeah, always that a they, bonus, right? They delay. It's yeah. always nice. I have the same so, experience on pen tip by the way yeah so so i just you know that the, the, my pick of the week is actually mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. notebooks and writing things down right write down your thoughts collect your thoughts go back and review them it's something that i'm diving into in the last you know months and getting a lot out of so there you go all right i'll, I'll pick up the next one which is um it's a bit of a nerdy project but i'm totally enamored by it uh if you're technically just a tiny little bit technically inclined um i think i think you don't even have to be able to hold a like a soldering iron for it um and if you like studio photography then there's a little game changer i think uh, you can build your own let's say fully programmable led light setup for 20 bucks um and all you need is again this is nerdy so um you need a bunch of leds like a light strip of some of some sort they come in any length up to i don't know 20 meters or something like lots of light uh you need a little chip called an esp32 this is what it looks like okay. a computer thing um mm -hmm. with a usb uh plug and you need a piece of free software and the whole setup again slight technical inclination but not a lot you don't even have to go on a, on a, in a terminal command line whatever um it's all on a website and you plug it in and you program it and and then you have a an led light setup that where every single one of these hundreds of leds on it is directly addressable everyone so, 
every single one. You get to turn on and off each of those LEDs with any light color because they are all RGB. So you get to um, to to split them in segments. Um, you can have uh, 2D panels like 16 by 16 and so on LEDs. That was my question. Where can you every pull single them into a one panel? is fully addressable. And then, of course, you can play like colorful light shows on it and and be like make it look like a circus but you can also just make them white warm white cold white um any color you like and program them and save that thing it's wi-fi it's again it's much simpler than it sounds and and then you've spent maybe 25 bucks for the whole setup and spend half an hour setting it up and that's it wow so good. you can you can build your own fully programmable light box for your macro photography. You can put it on on stands and make it into a full fledged setup course, in your studio. Yeah. So uh, it's pretty it's cool. pretty awesome. It's pretty cool. So uh, I'll link a, a video in the show notes um, where the software is explained and the, this little driver processor that you have that you need for it is like five bucks maybe ten so really easy simple cool and, cool, and a cool little like weekend project <laughs> so uh adrian no no jeremiah you jeremiah are next yeah yeah last one on you the know, list this is uh, as something i like just to you know tip everybody on um a very talented photographer jamie lee trett mm, never heard um, of him me neither until now, no. <laughs> um, I found this person. I've been following them, and I just again in the discussion of you know Martin Parr, Stephen Shore, you know uh, Eggleston. I, I I just find his work to be consistent, funny, interesting, well done. And I don't know him from Adam. I don't even know much about him, but I do also like the quote at the top of his page, which is that reality is often disappointing. That is, it was. Now reality can be whatever I want. And he quotes Thanos from the Avengers Infinity War. <laughs> <laughs> a great <laughs> philosopher. <laughs> There's a lot of social commentary in his photography. I love it. It's cool. Yeah, I think it's it's very, very uh very, very strong work and worth yeah. a dive into his sensibility. Interesting. Also, interesting how he how he uses light. I see a lot of like frontal flash. Frontal flash photography, yes, definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Very harsh. Cool. Very good. All right. Well. Wow. Okay. Right. I have one question for you both before we leave the show, right? Sure. Okay. It's entirely frivolous. So tomorrow I have a day off, by which I mean like a whole day all to myself. And one of the things I and I never this never happens, right? One of the things I want to do is watch a movie. So my question to you is, what movie should I watch tomorrow? Ah. <laughs> um I would I would pick up one that's pretty high on my list, and it's an old one from the mid '80s, and it's Brazil by Terry Gilliam. Ooh, Have I kind of like that? Gilliam's work. I don't think I've ever watched Brazil actually. This, but it's I a like right, it's a wild work. right. You'll come out of it, it probably with your head spinning, but uh, <laughs> it's it's awesome. I it, com completely love that movie okay, for many cool. many reasons. Well, thank you, Jeremiah. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I'll, I'll kind of focus on this year's movies, right? Um, and of course, you know, I could say, oh, you got to see Oppenheimer, you got to see, you know, uh, the usuals that you will see. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to recommend a movie that you may not immediately want to see, but should see. And it's called Dream Sequence. I've okay. heard of that. It's a Nicolas so Cage starring movie. Okay. About a kind of professor um, who seems to have his likeness show up all of a sudden in many people's dreams. <laughs> oh. And that's all I'm going to say about it. But it okay. is a wonderful, fabulous, ironic, smart, and well-acted movie. So I recommend that. That would be okay. a great movie to see on your day off. And Watch I, both yeah. of them. Watch both of them. <laughs> 
I, technically, I have time to watch two movies. I'm not well, sure whether yeah. I, I have other things I want to do as well. But so Brazil and Dream Sequence. Okay. Well, thank you both for your movie well, recommendations. One, one last piece of advertising for Brazil. It features uh, Robert De Niro as a guerrilla plumber. There you okay. Go. Yeah. All right. Brazil is one of the greats. Anyway, um, Dream Sequence. I've just put that on my list. So definitely going to watch this. All right. This brings us to the end of this episode uh, a new year is upon us and maybe these questions have helped I don't know trigger something in our listeners minds possibly maybe maybe you guys played along um, we'll have a couple more for next one uh, for next week and uh, yeah the, the whole photography thing starts again with a new year Great. Goes in circles. All <laughs> That's right. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. All right. We'll be back in a week. You can find us online at The Future Photography. Join our Discord. Discuss with us. And until then, everyone, take care and have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com.